Join me in prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we're so grateful to worship you today. We're so grateful for the work that you're doing in our lives and what you're doing in this place. And Lord, keep it up. Because we look to you and depend upon you for your care. There's so many in our midst that need your comfort and your strength, and not just spiritually, but physically as well. Lord, would you grant us that comfort? And would you grant us clear spiritual eyes and hearts that are bent towards a life of worship? Lord, we thank you for your work in the world. Bless those ministries that you've led us to support. Samaritan, Pastor David and Firefall, Potter's Clay, FCA, and the others that we support. And may we, may we look forward to the discussions that we'll have in heaven with those who've come to know you through those and other ministries. Lord, we ask that the Holy Spirit might move in this country, might mobilize your church to spread your gospel right at the point of need in this land and throughout the world. We know that you're doing that already, Lord, and for that we're grateful. And now, Lord, what we ask in this moment is that the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts, that they might be pleasing to you in this moment. And it's in Jesus' name and for his honor we pray. Amen. We're in John chapter 12. Now, this week I received a couple of thank you notes. It always feels good when you receive a thank you note, doesn't it? It means you've done something that somebody appreciates. Thank you notes or thank you gifts or thank you celebrations. That's what they are. They're wonderful opportunities to express gratitude and appreciation for your kindness or for your generosity or for doing something meaningful. And it was recognized. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to look at what I believe is just such an occasion a thank you dinner that's given in Jesus' honor. And, and most of you, or maybe probably all of you, we know the story. In John chapter 11, we're actually going to talk about that next week. But Lazarus became ill, and he died. And then Jesus goes in the tomb that's rich in the stench of death and raises Lazarus from the dead. Well, that stirred up the Jewish leaders. It made them issue death threats both to Jesus and to Lazarus. And so as a result, not because Jesus was scared, because his time had not come yet, they left for a while. And now we come to chapter 12 and the story that Debbie read, and about a month had passed. And it tells us that it is now six days before Passover. In fact, also in this chapter is the triumphal entry. So the, so, so the day is drawing. And now the disciples are heading back to Passover back to Judea, back to harm's way. So here's Mary and Martha and Lazarus, and they get together and they decide <clears throat> to have a dinner for Jesus at the home of Simon the leper. He was a healed leper because they wanted to honor Jesus and thank him for bringing Lazarus back to life. At least that's what I see in this passage. And so here's what we want to do. <clears throat> This morning, we want to look at these dear friends who were followers of Jesus. We want to look at their expression of gratitude. And what we see, we see a picture of three witnesses working out their belief and friendship with Jesus Christ. And we want to ask ourselves this morning, where's the application for me as a follower and a friend of Christ? So the first person we see is Martha. And you know a little bit about Martha. Martha... <clears throat> Martha was a worker. Martha the worker. She served. What we know about her is that she is a servant. Now we find her preparing dinner. <clears throat> and I think that's something that's very important here for us to think about. She's serving. She's working for this dinner to honor the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we work or when we worked, I think the question is, do we work to honor Christ? You know, Colossians chapter 3 says, Whatever you do, do your work heartily for the Lord, knowing uh, that you're not working for men. Since you know that you receive an inheritance from the Lord as reward, it is the Lord Christ you're serving. Do your work heartily for the Lord. A number of years ago, we took a group down to Florida to work alongside a church who was ministering to Haitian refugees. Some of them had just arrived. Some of them had been there for a while. And there's a community 
of people who immigrated from Haiti. And so we went there to help. We just went there to come alongside of them. We just went there to do whatever they had for us. And so after a couple of days of being there, a couple of us were tasked with painting a couple of rooms in a home. And so we're given paint and we're given brushes and we're told to go after it. And so here I am, stand, this, this standing, you'll love this, Steve. I'm standing on a bed with a roller painting the ceiling. And it's 88 degrees in there. And I'm sweating. And there's three strapping teenagers in the next room watching TV. So I'm thinking all these thoughts. I'm an enabler, you know. And these, you know, you know, these guys should be the ones in here painting. I mean, it seemed like a waste. You know, give them the pain and let them paint. It's like, what's better, giving a man a fish or teaching him how to fish? And so I'm thinking about all this. And then I remembered Colossians chapter 3. I remembered that Jesus served. In fact, Jesus washed the disciples' feet. He was the last one. They should have all volunteered to wash his feet. And yet Jesus is doing the menial task of washing his disciples' feet. And I thought, you know, I didn't think right away, but it took me a while to get there. But I thought we, we're, we were there to serve and honor Jesus Christ by completing the work as best we could in the time that we were there. Do your work heartily. That's a picture of what, what Mary's, Mary's worship, I mean, Martha's worship took the form of being a servant. Why do we do our work heartily? Because as believers, we have a boss. And he's a good boss. He's our friend. He's a servant. That's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ fully did his job to honor his father, and he is still working. And when we labor for the glory and honor of God, our work has value no matter what it is, whether highly significant or menial. This applies to all work, not just church work. In fact, this letter written to the Colossians, this was a large contingent of the church there were made up of slaves. They were reading this letter. We do our work heartily. Martha was cooking, setting the table, whatever it looked like, pots and pans, serving in order to honor Jesus who was there in his presence. And in a way, a very true way, we model and reflect Jesus Christ when we work to honor him. And when we labor to honor him, our labor's never in vain. Martha was a worker. Martha was a servant. Then the next person we come to in the passage is Lazarus. Lazarus, the witness. Here he is, he's reclining next to Jesus at the table, and he'd been healed quite significantly by Jesus. I mean, he's brought back from death to life. That's pretty major, I would say. Lazarus was a witness for Christ. Well, how so? Well, we know that Lazarus was given, literally given, new life by Jesus. And that's what Jesus does. You know the old analogy of of Jesus can take a caterpillar and turn it into a butterfly. Yes, that's true. But it's more than that. Jesus can definitely take something and make it into something else. He can take something good and he can make it better. He can do that. But what he really excels in is when he takes something that's dead and makes it alive. Ephesians 2 says this, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. For it is by grace you have been saved. Lazarus had been dead for four days. I suspect he's starting to stink. And now here he is at this party sitting next to Jesus. That's what the gospel message is all about. It's it's not just about making good people better. It's about making dead people, people that that are spiritually separated from God. That's what death means in the Bible. Not only physical death, but spiritual death as well. Making them alive. Lazarus was dead. He wasn't mostly dead. He was fully dead. And Jesus breathed life and life into him. And that enabled Lazarus to respond to Jesus' words when he said, come forth. I might be wrong about this, but I couldn't find anywhere where Lazarus speaks 
in the Bible, not this Lazarus. But his life, in a way, is the gospel. It is the Bible. It doesn't say Lazarus was a hard worker. I'll tell you, that Lazarus, he was a good Christian. He might have witnessed. He might have passed out tracts. He might have gone to soup kitchens. He might have had, who knows what he did. But all the Bible says is that Lazarus was a friend of Jesus and that Jesus raised him from the dead. He's a witness, not by what he does, but by what Jesus did in him and for him. And fundamentally, we hear, be a witness. Be a witness for Christ. Testify for Christ. And that begins not with what we do, but by what Jesus has done in us and for us. And it flows from that. You see, everything from this point on that Lazarus did was done with new life because God literally raised him from the dead. And there's something else about a witness that we see in this story towards the end of what uh, we heard this morning. I mean, apparently, resurrecting Lazarus was a big deal. I mean, that would probably be a pretty big deal. So big, in fact, that people heard about it and they were curious. In verse 9 and 10, talk about that. It said, a large crowd looked for Jesus. They, of Jews, found out that Jesus was there and they came because they wanted to see what was going on. It's kind of been that way all along. They not only wanted to see Jesus, but they wanted to see this guy that, that supposedly Jesus raised from the dead. So they came to see Lazarus. So what do the chief priests do? The chief priests who had already decided to kill Jesus, now they say, well, we're going to kill Lazarus too because he might cause us problems. And it says that on account of what the people saw, it said many were going over to believe in Jesus. Lazarus was identified with Jesus. That's what a witness does. Identifies with Jesus Christ. A witness in a courtroom, a witness for Jesus Christ, they're committed to a side for the defendant or for the plaintiff. They're committed to what they saw and what they believe they saw. And a witness for Christ is committed to the side of Jesus Christ. And the reason he was a witness is because God had given him new life. Jesus Christ had resurrected him from the dead. And his witness, the witness of Lazarus, was causing people to believe. But it was causing other people to get upset. And in some ways, the gospel, and we see it in the gospel of John, the gospel is a great divide. So we see Lazarus. He received new life. He heard the voice of Jesus. Lazarus, come forth. And now he's showing his love by being beside him, honoring him. Modeling this new life in the presence of Jesus. That's a witness. So we have Mary the worker, we have Lazarus the witness, and Martha the worker, and Lazarus the witness. And now we come to Mary the worshiper. Even if I call her Martha, I'm talking about Mary. Problem with that. Where do we find Mary? Well, we find her in Luke 10. What she's doing, she's sitting at Jesus' feet in Luke 10, learning from Jesus. Taking it all in. It's probably not the only time she sat at the feet of Jesus. Growing in her understanding and appreciation for him. Then we find in John chapter 11. Weeping. Falling at Jesus' feet. A dear picture of humility. Causing Jesus to weep even. Now we find her in John chapter 12. Here at this dinner. And she had something very special that she desired to do for Jesus. In her devotion, she gathered a jar of expensive perfume and broke it. She pours it on Jesus. That's an amazing thing. You know, normally what what, what would happen is when a guest who was honored at a a dinner, at a party or something like that, it was customary to wash the guest's feet with water and even to anoint their head with a drop of perfume. And there were rare instances where someone might actually wash the guest's feet with perfume. But to break a jar of expensive spikenard, which is a, it cost a year's wages. In fact, these types of perfume were investments that grew in value. It would take a year's wages to purchase this, this, this pound or this pint of, of this perfume. Never happened. That never happened. 
in, 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 the, in the normal custom of that day. And then what she did was almost as incredible. Some might say as incredible. She did something that no woman in the culture ever did. She lowered herself by undoing her hair and using her hair to wash Jesus' feet. Whatever you think about that, we see the love and the devotion in worship and the humility and the, the, the sacrifice and the, the extravagant adoration. She washed his feet with her hair. She was all in. And the whole house was filled with the pleasing aroma of this act. You know, Jesus had gone into the tomb, into the stench of death, and gave new life to Lazarus. And now Jesus and Lazarus are sitting next to each other in the pleasing aroma of Mary's sacrificial act of worship. That's the contrast that's offered in the gospel. I mean, take a little rabbit trail. Two things really quickly. A couple of verses that I want to pair together to uh, that speaks to this Christ-likeness. First in Ephesians 5, when we're talking about a, an aroma. Ephesians 5, 1 says, Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering in sacrifice to God. Jesus gave himself, there's that idea, as a fragrant offering to us. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, we read this. For we are the aroma of Christ to God. So there's a picture here of worship. There's a picture here of Christ-likeness. Jesus gave himself up as a fragrant aroma. We are the fragrant aroma. Mary poured out her, her 401k, her life savings, as an act of worship to Jesus. Devotion in worship is the reflex of true faith. And Mary was able to worship in this way. Why? How could she willingly and extravagantly break open a bottle of expensive perfume? Because her bank account was in her heart. And her heart belonged to Jesus Christ. She was a, ple she was a pleasing aroma. So that's Mary, the worshiper. Martha the worker, Lazarus the witness, Mary the worshiper, and now we come to Judas. I couldn't, the only W I could think of is wimp. I really wanted to use the word party pooper or knucklehead. Judas is mentioned in this passage, and he's there. All this is going on, and there's Judas. He's watching. You know, he's over there the whole time. He's calculating. Then he speaks up. Jesus, you could, you could, this, you could sell this perfume and give the money to the poor. Boy, that, that would that'd be a wonderful thing. And, and you know what? He was right. Because that perfume was expensive. A full year's work based on minimum wage. If you look at other accounts of this event in the other Gospels, it's pretty interesting because, you know, we think, you know, where's G there's Judas. He's not, he's not doing the right thing. But in the other Gospels, it says the disciples questioned Mary as well. Were they wrong? Were they wrong in doing that? Well, let's just think about this for a minute. I probably shouldn't say this, but it might just be me. But if we're honest, I bet there's many dads who've married off their daughter who could identify with this statement. You know, the cost of this wedding for 45 minutes you could buy a car. You could, you could have a good down payment for a house. And this is going to be over in, in, in just a short period of time. You know, maybe, maybe think that way, calculating. Or how about this? Suppose, someone, suppose someone's attending a small country church and it just happens that that church has a hole in the roof. And whenever it rains, there's a drip, drip, drip of water on the pews. The pastor knows it needs to be fixed. And then say someone comes up and offers a large sum of money. I want to paint the sanctuary. Now, if I was that pastor, I'd be thinking, it seems to me in my calculations that that money would be better spent on fixing the roof than painting the sanctuary. 
I think we can calculate like that. I think that perhaps that's what the disciples were doing. Maybe the priority in this example is fixing the roof. That makes sense. You could even say that's called being a good steward. So then why did Jesus single out Judas for what he said? Why why is it that Judas' words were like a, a stench in the pleasing aroma of Mary's worship perfume? It's because Jesus knew Judas' heart. And I can tell you right now that that Judas was not interested in the poor. He was interested in getting his hands on some of that money. That's what the passage says. In fact, he literally was in charge of the money. He's the one that held on to the money bag. We see Mary and we see Martha and we see Lazarus. Selfless giving. Reminds me of Romans 12, 1 and 2. If you don't know that verse, go home, look it up this afternoon and underline it because that's the essence of worship. Selfless giving. Look at Jesus to the cross. Selfless giving. Look at Judas dipping into the till, holding on to the money. Didn't get any out of this deal, but he turned around a few days later and sold himself for 30 pieces of silver. Worship is selfless. Judas was selfish. And his bank account was also his heart. And Jesus knew that his heart was turned towards himself. Someone once commented on this passage. When a man has gone so far in selfish greed that he has left common honesty behind him, the sight of self-surrendering love looks to him like folly. And Levi Lusko, who's a pastor, made this comment. The world of gratitude gets larger and larger, and the world of stingy gets smaller and smaller. Judas had a mindset of scarcity because he could never get enough. Contrast that with the mindset of Mary's act of worship. Think of words used in the Bible that describe the gospel, that can be used to describe Mary's worship. Words like give and abundance and lavished upon. And Jesus saw what was going on with Judas and he responded. He says, let her alone. You'll always have the poor among you. Sarcasm. He he knew that Judas was not interested in the poor. It's as as if Jesus was saying, okay, Judas, you're so concerned about the poor. There'll always be opportunities to help the poor if that's what you really want to do. But for now, let her worship. There's irony there. I mean, look look at the scene. Who was the poor among them? Was it the selfless givers? Was it the ones who followed Jesus in work and witness and worship? The one who served? The one whose life was given back to him? The one who poured that sweet-smelling perfume, they gave, they received. Judas took, and he died. What Judas was holding on to was really holding on to him. So I think there's some questions, some takeaways from this that we might could ask ourselves. Do we have areas in our lives that we're holding on to Maybe they're worries, maybe they're concerns, maybe they're priorities that we cling to that that actually hinder us. Do we have those? Jesus, Jesus died for them. I think another thing we could ask ourselves, this is a, an occasion of thankfulness because they were grateful for what Jesus had done in the life of Lazarus and really the impact he had on the whole family. Are we grateful and glad for what the Lord has done in our lives? You know, Lazarus eventually died. And I suspect that on the way, he probably had some sore muscles and pain, just like all of us. But that didn't diminish the fact that God, through Jesus Christ, gave him new life. And everyone who has faith in the work of Jesus Christ has been brought from death to life and has been assured of the hope of eternal life, assured from Jesus Christ himself. Are we grateful for what the Lord has done in our lives? Do we sincerely seek to serve the Lord in whatever we do? Here's one. Do we hold out open hands in worship? And worship is not just what we do in this hour. Worship is what we do every day. It's our spiritual service of worship. Do we we hold out open hands 
for the Lord to take and use what we have, and then for the Lord to give us what he wants us to have. I think the last thing is this. In whose name is that bank account that resides in all of our hearts? It's a cloudy day. There's nothing to do. You can think about all this stuff all afternoon. <laughs> but here's the thing. You see, when, when we follow the master with love in our hearts, we follow him with open hands. We worship open-handed. We give the Lord whatever we have. And we're open to whatever he gives us. And we're glad and we're grateful to him for being all that he is in our lives. That's a little bit of what we see in this thank you dinner. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this occasion and that's recorded in the Bible and then how it really speaks to us, speaks to me. Father, I just pray that we'll be able to walk with you in a way where we really enjoy you. I pray that we might have gratitude in our hearts, that our hands might be open, and we might have the humility of Mary, even the fall at your feet, to receive what you have for us. May we find great satisfaction in that, all for your honor and glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.